Okay, so let's start the session. Uh, this is the APCT of Cloud Retroid Algorithm in 2021 at TCTAP workshop. So, uh, first of all, welcome uh, to this session. So, my co chair is, uh, my name is Tsuchikane, and the co chair is Jen. And uh, we have uh, uh, four panelists uh, Dr. Muramatsu, Dr. Igarashi, and Dr. Lim, and Dr. Lee. Uh, welcome to our session. So let's start the lecture. Okay, it's my honor to introduce the first speaker, uh, Professor Gao from uh, Taiwan National University. And uh, Professor Gao, please. Thank you, moderators, for your kind introduction. Um, uh, I'll start the talk with the retrograde channel selection and the wiring. So this is, these are my disclosures. Uh, with all the existing algorithms, be it hybrid, uh, our APCTO club algorithm, or the European algorithm, we all understand that the, the existence of uh, uh, interventional collateral is very important in the decision of deciding uh, which way to go for the PCI. Uh, the significance of interventional collateral is that if you can track uh, interventional collateral, then most of the time the case will be successful. But uh, most of the complications for retrograde PCI happen during tracking of the collateral. And for one CTO, there are uh, usually multiple uh, interventional channels existing. So how do we choose these channels and how do we cross them? I think it's the theme of the topic today. Uh, in terms of the channel characteristics, of course, we understand the size should matter. Uh, according to Gerald Vanner's uh, uh, classification, there are zero, one, or two, and even sometimes uh, artery-like channel, we call it CC3. So the size, of course, is very important. The larger should be the better one. So, uh, channel tortuosity, of course, is the other uh, very significant uh, characteristics. And uh, with this definition uh, provided by Margaret, uh, pro uh, published several years ago, we can define whether a channel is a tortuous one or not, uh, according to this very specific uh, definition. And obviously, less tortuous the channel, of course, it should be better for us to choose. There are also other characteristics, such as the uh, uh, angle of attack and also the length from the emerging point uh, illustrated in this slide. We all understand that if the channel is in a large angle uh, with the attack uh, uh, main vessel, then it, it will be more difficult to handle. And also the distance of this emerging point into the distal true vessel to the distal cap, it should be longer the better. And also uh, often we talked about the channel classification or types or classes. Uh, we understand that LAD and PDA, the, co the connection is called septal and any other uh, two epicardial vessel can be connected with the epicardial channel. And also there's a specific set of epicardial channels connecting the circumflex and the PLA territory, and they are traversing the uh, atrioventricular groove. So it can be called uh, AC channel or atrioventricular groove channel. And of course the artificial uh, SVG can be used as retrograde collateral as well. But these classes, are they really different? I'm not sure, because in fact, all these channels are delicate. If you injure one of them, you could have catastrophe. Not necessarily that the septals are safer than the others, because like shown in this one, you can have a bulging septal hematoma causing a dry tempona or a acute Holcomb hemodynamic. And also the AV groove channel, if you ruptured, you can have a uh, pulmonary venous return obstruction or the change of mitral ring causing acute MR and also respiratory failure. So these are channels that will give you different uh, pathophysiology other than just pericardial tamponade. And uh, you know, the pericardial tamponade can be easily handled with tapping and drainage. So in the, the most important part is that we should not, we should not damage any uh, channel and we should not think that one of these channels are safer than the others for our choices. So like uh, these cases uh, where we have a LAD CTO, you could have septal connect connections. You can also have epicardial connections around the apex. This is the other uh, lesion. Again, we could have septals and some are more torturous than the others. And also these epicardial uh, connections from the corners branch. So actually, how do we choose these channels to start with? 
Should we have uh, the larger one as our main goal, or the, the, the straighter one, or we go for the septal uh, as, as our default first channel? Uh, we have looked into our database and published uh, several years ago. Actually, we put all these characteristics into analysis, and then finally we found out that we only have to calculate the tortuosity and also the size of the channel. And if the channel is big enough, which is CC2 or three, we give it one point. And if the vessel, or, or, I'm sorry, the channel is not torturous, then you will get two points. And once the channel had a score of more than two, then the prediction of a success is more than 90%. So we think that, that this is a very simple and uh, uh, practical scoring system and got this published a couple of years ago. So these are my uh, 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 suggested the channel selection algorithm. If you have multiple channels, you look for tortuosity and size, and then add up these numbers and go for the higher score one. The other uh, characteristics such as the angle of attack, LEP, or others are just minor technical considerations. Uh, there are also other uh, scoring systems for the channel. Uh, this is provided uh, by the Japanese uh, registry and published uh, two years ago. It's called J Retro Score and separate the channel into septal and non-septal ones. And then you calculate according to these uh, pictures. But in, in my personal feeling, this is a bit more complicated than uh, the proposed one uh, by me. So uh, of course uh, we can uh, try to understand this and apply this uh, algorithm in our selection. So uh, I think uh, the other important thing is that before you calculate this channel, you have to identify all the channels. So um, uh, a very good uh, baseline diagnostic is very important. You should have multiple projections, low magnification, and also the injection contrast should be generous and the timing of exposure should be long enough. We should not pen the table, and sometimes we have to do super selection. So this is a case example. We have RCA occluded, and if you inject from the left side first, you can see these AV groove channel, quite torturous, yes, but also you should inject from the other projection. This is the uh, RAO caudal, and then you realize it's torturous, yes, and also you pay attention to this angle of its exit from the uh, circumflex and also its entry into the PLA. This will help you to uh, judge, uh, to choose your devices and also help you, help you with the wiring. Corner springe is also something we often miss. So during the diagnostic, we should avoid deep engaging into the right corner. From the left, left panel, you can see this is a LED uh, CTO. Uh, from, the, from the right injection, it doesn't uh, you know, look like you have a multiple septal connections. But if you pull the guide just a bit backwards, for example, or even use a micro catheter to advance into the uh, corner's branch, and with the selection, you can see there are copious collateral going into the LED distal to the CTO. This will help and guide your intervention a lot. Uh, once you decided which channel to go for, then you have to prepare yourself with the proper equipment. For the septals, usually a Sion or black should, uh, should be workable and also SUO03. Non-septals, usually we start with a SUO03, which is more uh, less traumatic, more flexible and lighter on the tip. The right uh, microcatheter is also very important. Uh, I have uh, made some list here. For the non-septal, you want something that is thin, flexible, uh, very uh, low resistance. For the septal, you need something a bit more robust. Uh, if you have an extremely long loop, then you have to think about the long uh, microcatheter, such as the uh, Chinese Instant Pass, which had the 170 centimeter version. Uh, for the uh, non suo wires, uh, they should be uh, intentional tip fracture compatible, meaning that intentionally we make a, a small joint at the tip to make it more flexible to go around this uh, very tortuous channel. So the actual wiring the wire should be handled very gently with the push and the rotation. We shouldn't over torque the wires, especially with the SUO03. The micro catheter should, should follow uh, adequately to prevent the distal wire knotting. And also we should mind the cardiac cycle, especially for the atrial ventricular groove connection because uh, the cycle will change that uh, channel more dramatically. You should pay attention to the imaginary route and therefore the tip select, uh, tip, selective tip injection sometimes is very, very important. This slide is provided uh, by uh, Sensei. So it, it, with the tip injection, 
we can actually identify these small curves, small branches, uh, unexpected uh, uh, apex configuration. If you don't do the tip injection, most of these detail will be missed with the baseline uh, diagnostic picture. So with this uh, tip injection, we can get this information such as a, a branch at the apex, invisible, very small, tiny uh, branches, continuous bend, or also a cube bend. And these will all change our philosophy in our wire choice and handling. So this is an actual case of wire manipulation. Uh, with the Caravel, you can see uh, SUO03 will go into this AV groove channel. Even though it's quite torturous, but with the gentle push, the wire often goes uh, on its own. But then we have to follow the microcatheter because if we don't uh, uh, follow the microcatheter and we torque on the wire, sometimes the tip of the wire will not on its, unto itself. So this is uh, another case showing that uh, uh, the combination of uh, SUO uh, into this epicardial uh, torturous collateral. So we should pay attention to the uh, motion of the wire tip and also the ECG, uh, because when we are in a small branch, we push, most of the time we will have a, a premature beat. And then with that, we should notice that maybe we should change the wire direction. We shouldn't uh, push the wire further on too hard. Okay, so this is uh, to show you the uh, uh, advancement of a microcatheter. We should uh, make use of the wire shaft. So once the wire get into the distal vessel, we should advance as far as possible so that we can meet, make use of the shaft to give support to our microcatheter. This is another case. You see the wire is far out. And for this particular case, actually because the loop is so long, we have to use a 170 uh, centimeter version of the microcatheter so that we can reach into the distal and then make the uh, retrograde case to complete. And also we have to understand the be different behavior of uh, uh, these different microcatheters. With the Corsair Pro, because the, the shaft is more uh, robust, it's talkable, yes, but uh, if you pay attention, sometimes it will change the uh, configuration of the, uh, collect, uh, of the collateral channel. You see, if you rotate too much and you, if you advance too much, it will make a uh, 180 degree turn. So sometimes we have to push and pull on the microcatheter instead of just cons constant uh, integrate push. And when the tip of the catheter actually cross in more distally, pay attention to the proximal side because the proximal thick shaft will change the collateral configuration as well. Sometimes this could be dangerous. You see, when we pull on the microcatheter, the configuration of the channel will be changed. And this is the behavior of a caravel. Caravel is very thin. And usually we don't advise to torque on the microcatheter. So just a gentle push. But because of this uh, feature, sometimes the actual advancement is limited. We have to pay attention that sometimes the distal cone, cone will separate from the proximal tube. So this is a very vulnerable junction here. So when we uh, notice that, that there is no further advancement of the microcatheter, we should stop instead of continue to push on the uh, microcatheter and also avoid uh, torquing on the microcatheter. In comparison, the new uh, Corsair Pro XS is a very delicate and a very, a very good one. It's of a very thin profile, torquable, very slippery. And also the uh, beauty of this uh, microcatheter is that uh, once you make uh, the, uh, cro the cross of this channel, usually the channel configuration is not changed too much. And therefore the risk of damaging this delicate uh, torturous channel will be minimized. So I think these microcatheters, because of their different characteristics, we have to understand how to manipulate them and also handle them in, in a very knowledgeable way. And also we have to pay attention to the uh, cyclic motion. Like I mentioned earlier, for the AV groove channel, this is more dramatic. So this is a case I've picked to show you. You can see with each cardiac cycle, the wire actually can be uh, advanced and pulled back with a significant distance. 
This is not the actual push on the wire, but actually the cardiac squeezing motion. So we have to pay attention of this cardiac cycle, especially for the AV groove. While we are moving the microcatheter, this is also very significant. So uh, usually we should step on the floral, wait for a few cardiac cycle, and then in our mind, we get prepared before we actually uh, push on the device. We have to synchronize our motion with the cardiac cycle. So I think in conclusion uh, of my brief talk, uh, choosing and tracking of a con uh, interventional channel is the most critical step for any retrograde CTO PCI. Selection is according to their tortuosity and diameter. And personally, I think uh, the class of a septal non-septal is of a minor one. None of these is safer than the other one. And we should gather all IC detail information with multiple and good projections. And sometimes microcatheter tip injection is very important and necessary. And we should understand our available devices and we should handle them with the proper um, management and emotion. So I thank you for your uh, listening. Uh, I will start my presentation. My tema is uh, uh, what if the microcatheter cannot cross the channel? So I have no disclosure. So this is a uh, so usual uh, strategy in retrograde PCI. At first, uh, so uh, antigrade preparation was when antigrade wiring was started. And after that, it failed. So retrograde channel tracking, Dr. Kao uh, presented uh, so the detail. And uh, so after that, uh, we should uh, advance uh, so retrograde micro cache because uh, so we have to change the micro uh, guide wire from the retrograde approach. And uh, after that, antigrade balloon was advanced and uh, reverse cut technique was performed at this point. And after that, uh, so retrograde uh, wire and micro cashier advanced to antigrade guiding cashier. And externalization with uh, RG3 were performed. And uh, after that, uh, stenting from the antigrade approach. This is uh, as usual uh, procedure uh, steps. Uh, but uh, so sometimes, so retrograde micro cashier cannot cross the collateral channel. This is not rare. Uh, this is uh, sometimes uh, I uh, experience this situation. So uh, how to choose uh, so uh, this uh, how to choose the strategy at this point? So first choice is uh, so change the kind of the micro cashier. This is. That's a very easy way. So this is our CTO as a distal point and. Uh, there was no visible collateral channel. And uh, so this is a movie. Uh, so th there's a Kugel channel, but uh, so you can see that's a very severe uh, bending portion at this point. And uh, of course, uh, so there are some uh, retrograde septal channel, but uh, so very tiny. So uh, at first, uh, so I started to antigrade upload, but uh, so that was some um, wires were failed. So that uh, so changed to the so retrograde upload and check some some septal channel. Mm, this septal channel looks uh, connected. So that uh, so some guide wire was uh, negotiated and the Xion and uh, so zero three and finally Xion uh, crossed it to the so uh, PD branch. But uh, so Caravel cannot cross at this. Um, a lot point, this point. So that uh, so I change it to the Corsair, uh, but uh, so Corsair cannot cross. And uh, after that, I change it to the so fine cross. Uh, fine cross is a uh, so soft uh, chip of the soft chip. So that uh, so uh, fine cross finally could cross the channel relatively easily. So we have some uh, micro uh, Dr. Uh, Kao presented uh, so uh, Caravel, Corsair Pro, recently uh, Corsair XS. And uh, so uh, Telmo company uh, developed uh, so new micro uh, to Jizai. Uh, Jizai is a very soft one. So uh, we are categorized as two, so uh, hard micro and a soft micro -cachet. But uh, so uh, Corsair uh, micro has a big advantage of that, of that uh, so we can rotate those uh, micro -cachet. So we have to know about uh, so each kind of the micro -cachet about the uh, so advantage or risk. <laughs> So uh, next step is uh, so make strong backup force. 
So this is also RCA CTO, and uh, we use the, so this channel. So Xion could cross uh, uh, this channel, but uh, uh, Caravel cannot cross. But uh, so and uh, directed the balloon dilatation with circumflex and the anchor balloon technique was performed. And uh, so um, due to this technique, uh, so Caravel can cross uh, uh, this channel like this. So that's also a uh, strong backup uh, for the anchor balloon technique we are, uh, is uh, one choice. But also we have to care uh, not to push, not to so hard. So this is uh, our CTO and uh, very tiny channel. And uh, so that also uh, XDR could cross, cross. but uh, uh, Corseo could not cross and uh, change it to the uh, Caravel. And uh, fortunately, so Caravel could cross the channel. So that uh, so this is a uh, so little bit different situation. Uh, Caravel uh, could cross the channel. And uh, after that, uh, so uh, we advanced uh, so Caravel for the so retrogradely. But uh, so uh, at the region, uh, Caravel could not advance. So uh, strongly pushed with the anchor balloon technique. So uh, you can see the Caravel prolapse as a subceptor channel. So like this one. And uh, so this prolapse contribute to the so uh, septal hematoma. This con uh, this is uh, so sometimes a cause of the so dry tamponade. So uh, we have to uh, drainage at this point. So that's uh, so too strong uh, advance, uh, too strong push uh, has to uh, has a risk of like uh, this uh, damage of channel. We have to care. So another choice is a balloon dilatation. So this is also RCA CTO, and there you can see some uh, collateral uh, from the septal channel. And uh, this case is uh, Sion wire was crossed, but also uh, Coruscant cannot cross, and the Caravel and the fine cross both gasheter cannot cross it. So that's uh, so we use the uh, losing OTW balloon, and uh, so one time directed at the septal uh, channel, and uh, finally uh, this OTW balloon can cross the uh, channel. So that uh, so balloon dilatation is uh, one choice. And another choice is uh, so change the channel. So this is also RCA CTO. And uh, so this is also septal channel. And the septal channel is uh, so a little bit uh, so difficult to negotiate the guide wire. So that's uh, finally, so uh, Xion so 03 was not crossed and the XDR uh, crossed this channel. And uh, Corsair cannot cross and uh, fine cross also not crossed. So that's uh, so one more balloon was directed at this point, and uh, after that balloon advanced it. So um, you can see so the uh, channel figure is uh, changed. Mm, this is also hematoma of the uh, septal channel. After that, uh, so uh, every micro catheter cannot cross. So that's uh, so in this situation, uh, we change it to the channel. Uh, so as a septal channel, but uh, unfortunately, so this channel could not cross uh, every wire. After that, uh, so change it to the so epicardial channel, uh, but uh, this epicardial channel cannot cross. And uh, finally, so this has a uh, epicardial channel. So this one can uh, Xion and uh, Corseo can cross the uh, channel. So that's uh, so when uh, we cross not uh, we cannot cross a micro cassette one septal uh, one channel so um, looking for other channel is one choice and the final choice is a uh, kissing wire technique uh, this is a already CTO also this case is RCA is also a CTO so that's uh, so there is a no collateral from the RCA. And uh, so we can uh, see only one, only this channel. So this is also uh, from diagonal to LOAD. So, but also uh, uh, we can see the so very severe bending at this point. And uh, fortunately, uh, so 03 can uh, cross this epicardial channel. 
but uh, this wire cannot make straight this bending portion. So that uh, so caravel cannot cross this bending point. So I change it to the so called XS, but uh, so called XS cannot cross. And uh, uh, fine cross also cannot cross this point. And uh, there is a no channel. So that's uh, so at this point, I started uh, so kissing wire technique from the uh, undergrad IBAS guide, IBAS check, and uh, so looking for the entry point and uh, uh, negotiated. The, uh, this is a uh, guy next to three, and the uh, target is also uh, this guide wire. And uh, Rotational angiography is also uh, very useful in this situation. And the uh, anti-grade wire was succeeded to cross uh, so, uh, this point. And uh, this is a final angiography. So that's uh, so this is the final slide. Uh, what if the micro -cacheter cannot cross the channel? So one choice is also uh, change the kinds of the micro -cacheter. Uh, That is also uh, very easy way. And uh, so other choices uh, make strong backup force for the anchor balloon technique or some other child technique. And uh, balloon dilatation is uh, another choice uh, to cross the uh, uh, micro cachetter or balloon, the uh, OTW balloon. And uh, if failed, so change the channel is one choice. And the final choice is a uh, kissing wire technique. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Kawamoto. Uh, uh, several educational uh, cases we will discuss later. So I will introduce next speaker, uh, Professor uh, Eugene Wu from the Prince of Wales Hospital, Hong Kong. It was another lecture. Uh, Wu, please. Yes, thank you very much uh, for that kind introduction. So today I'm going to talk about catastrophic traps in retrograde CTO-PCI. The retrograde procedure, by the way it's done, sets you up for certain traps that if you fall into, will cause a big complication. So this talk is really addressing these complications. And there are 12 things we want to talk about in this talk. Donor artery thrombosis. So this RCA CTO reattempt, the first time has made a lot of anti-grade sub space. So anti-grade wire keeps getting stuck. This post-graft patient has a CERP SVG and has distal left main disease. But there are some septos that you can cross, and this distal epicardial septo, which is quite nice. So we managed to get across this easily uh, with a fine cross, and the retrograde wire just went straight through the lesion into the guiding. And with balloon trapping, we can get the fine cross across, externalize an RG3, do some fantastic stenting with a great result. Just as we got here, the patient started complaining of chest pain and blood pressure starting dropping. And you can see that the distal left main is starting to look hazy. And although there's a graph, the distal left main is diseased enough that if you put retrograde gear there for a long time, it's going to thrombose. And very soon, he had no left main flow and he was very ill. So we did some uh, thrombectomy. Uh, that wasn't very successful. We did some ballooning. And after that, we could actually get a good thrombectomy and we restore the flow back to the left main like this. Then, of course, to pay, keep things safe, we stented the left main and we got out of that trouble. But donor artery thrombosis is very dangerous. So we should always make sure that the ACT is about 300. And if it drops below 250, to be checking it very frequently in our lab every 15 minutes. Collateral channel ischemia is a problem, especially with dominant collateral channel. So if you experience collateral channel ischemia, you should find another collateral rather than persisting on an ischemic channel. Forgetting to use short guiding, this is a particularly big problem. Let me show you my problem case. This is a PDA OS CTO in a very diffusely diseased RCA in a post-graph patient. And uh, we have some nice septal channels, you can see. And uh, we took one of these septal channels and got across to the uh, PDA. And we could wire to the PDA like so, but it's very, very tough. And even a Conquest 12 gram cannot puncture into the distal RCA. But then our wire quite easily go up the graph and the graph looks very nice. The wire is quite free, no disease except at the very os. So we punctured uh, through the ostium into the anti-grade guiding. But the retrograde 
Corsair cannot reach because the guiding is too short. It almost reached. So we say push a bit harder, push a bit harder, and then the patient is in trouble because now you can see we dissected the left main. And uh, soon, no flow, very slow flow. So we have to stent the left main. This is after stenting. And of course, no more procedure at that point. <laughs> so short guiding, very important. Air embolism with trapping balloon. When we exchange things out from the retrograde side, we might use a trapping balloon. But this is very dangerous because we might trap air in. And if you put air embolism down the donor artery with a contralateral CTO, the patient becomes very sick. So always de-air the guiding after trapping. Poor wire position, channel perforation. Now, this is an old case. Um, this is septos to RCA CTO. We tried anti-grade parallel wire with the dual lumen catheter and failed. This is, uh, then we ballooned the LAD and we went across this channel. This is bad old days. You'd recognize the over the wire 2.0 balloon that we use, okay? In the pericardium, not good. So you can see here a little bit of leaking, but we thought we'll fix the LAD and the circumflex end. If we do it quickly, we should be okay and we reverse the heparin. But uh, after fixing this, reversing the heparin, two hours later, the patient came back and you can see tamponade. Very difficult subcostal. I had to do an apical stick, which was very difficult for me and very difficult for the patient. Uh, but you can still see a little bit of leak, but that's sealed off after draining. So always check the retrograde wire position before you cross your devices. The stent reverse cut, very popular but very dangerous. This is a LAD CTO, very short CTO. There's a beautiful septal channel, which we took up. But the problem is the septal channel lands quite near the CTO and the antigrade wire is very difficult. So you can see this stiff conquest wire is in a small septal, but there's some overlap between the two wires. So we tried to do reverse cut, not successful, but when we did IVIS, at this point of the IVIS on the left-hand side, both wires are in the same position. So I thought stent reverse cut. So here's the stent. After stenting, the retrograde wire easily goes into the stent and comes out. And I can check IVIS. And inside the stent, uh, most of the way, it seems to be in the right place. But I can't get the IVIS to the distal end of the stent because that's stuck. The wire is inside the septal. So anyway, I wired the antigrade guiding and I pushed the Corsair across. And uh, what I found was the Corsair couldn't go into the guiding and the patient's starting to feel very ill. So I outside the left main. And so now we are outside the left main and uh, we have uh, got uh, the stent is crushed and I can't get in. So in the end, the patient cannot tolerate this anymore. So we have to stop the procedure. So stent reverse car should be a very last resort. We must have IVIS to confirm the connection and ideally to see the whole position throughout the stent before we push anything through it. The subintimal path of a retrograde wire, this is very dangerous. This uh, very difficult osteo LED, I can't do anti puncture at all. So the retrograde wire is very near. I use a conquest to puncture it in. And I was going to, Externalize this wire, but I check another view. Very dangerous. You see a subintimal wire. If you stand over this, you're going to lose the circumflex. So it's very important in the osteo position to do anti grade preparation. And if you're going to go single wire cross, to check IVIS. Snaring of retrograde wire should be like stent reverse card, should be a last resort. So usually what we do is after successful reverse card, we wire the anti grade guiding with the retrograde CTO wire like this. After successfully wiring the guiding, we put a balloon to trap the retrograde CTO wire like this. After we trapped, we can push the microcatheter across and then we can take out the CTO wire and replace it with an RG3 wire like this. And then we're good to go. We can start stenting, it's very good. So when should we consider snaring? Well, usually the problem is we cross the CTO wire, but we cannot get the CTO wire into the guiding catheter. In this situation, we shouldn't start staring straight away because what we can do is push the retrograde wire far up the aortic arch. We can also use a balloon to anchor in the proximal vessel, the CTO wire. This will give enough support to push the retrograde microcatheter across the CTO. Then we can change to a softer wire or change to an RG3 to snare, which will be much safer. 
The danger of snaring the retrograde wire is that you could produce a very, very big angle when you pull the retrograde CTO wire into the guiding. And sometimes you cannot release this. And this wire cannot go back into the retrograde microcatheter. And then you're really stuck. So we should always uh, use other alternatives. Another alternative is to put a guide liner in the proximal vessel and wire the guide liner with the retrograde CTO wire. So these are all options we should try before we consider snaring. So uh, when we take out the retrograde corsair, we must lift up the retrograde guiding to avoid sucking in the retrograde guiding. So we need to put it back in the aorta, like this case, so that we don't suck in and damage the left main. So hydraulic dissection, the hybrid operator suggests we remove the anti-grade contrast syringe after we start doing reverse cards. This is a very good practice for us to undertake because it stops the risk of injecting and causing hydraulic dissection. If we rupture the balloon during reverse card and we suspect there's a perforation, don't inject contrast. Just replace it with a bigger balloon that can occlude the proximal cap. Because if you have perforated, as long as you occlude the proximal cap, you're not going to cause tamponade. So you can still carry on to do reverse card. After successful reverse card, you just stent it and then you can check. Often the stenting will seal off the perforation. Channel checking and removal. When we finish the case, what we should do is recross the corsair back into the antiquate guiding and then remove the RG3 until the distal end of the RG3 is in the antiquate guide. Then we draw back the corsair into the proximal donor artery and we check contrast on both sides to check for damage. Afterwards, we should recross the microcatheter to protect the channel as we pull back the RG3. Then both are to be removed together. So just in this case, you can see what we've done is uh, we've got the tip of the RG3 in the antigrade guiding, and we check an angel to make sure that we have not done any damage. And then we remove the RG3 after recrossing with the microcatheter. And finally, we check on both sides. to make sure the channel is intact. So if we find a perforation, we can easily trap the RG3 with a trapping balloon in the antigrade guiding, push the retrograde microcatheter back into the antigrade guiding, and then we have control on both sides and we can take our time to put microcatheters that can deliver cores or fat and blight both sides, and then we can coil it. So all of these details is in our paper that I published with uh, Tsutsikani in the Inherent Catastrophic Traps in Retrograde CTO PCI in CCI. And uh, you can find this paper in its version that you can download on our APCTO website. So that's www.apcto.club. So we even have a very nice picture of APCTO Club during COVID in there. But all our papers can be accessed on the website. So I encourage you to go and visit our website there and to check out the material and the teaching we have there. Thank you very much for this chance to present this talk to you. Uh, sorry, we have uh, only a few minutes to, for discussion, but please, uh, may we have uh, some comment from uh, panelists, uh, Muramatsu, Igarashi, Lim, and Lee? Any comments for the presentation? Okay, uh, I, have a, I have a small comment. Yep. Okay. Uh, recently in Japan, uh, Jizai new microcatheter is available. Mm. Mm. Uh, that one is a very excellent microcatheter and high deliverability without uh, rotation. And a big advantage of a micro, that microcatheter is uh, coating is excellent. Uh, usually, uh, Corsair is such a kind of uh, microcatheter, uh, coating uh, durability is not so good. So sometimes new brand new wine is necessary to continue uh, retrograde approach. However, designs are uh, not necessary to change. Very excellent wine, uh, excellent one. Near future, uh, in Asia, uh, probably available. So uh, please uh, expect uh, that performance. One comment. Maybe I can uh, ask uh, Dr. Abara, and, and uh, after one microcatheter fails to cross the channel. Um, how do you choose the next one? Is it by trial and error, or is there any specific logic to the uh, uh, selection yeah. of the next microcatheter? 
Thank you, Dr. Lim. Uh, so that is, uh, of course, also try and error is also as usual uh, procedure. And uh, but uh, so that is depend on the uh, channel. If the so uh, channel is a very tiny one, uh, so that is in this situation as uh, usually. So I uh, use Jizai uh, recently. But uh, so that, uh, but uh, so. Uh, of course, uh, so I think that so for channel negotiated the guide wire, so uh, channel uh, visibility is very important. So that's uh, so uh, my first choice is uh, usually so Caravel. So that's uh, so if failed to change it to the so Jizai or if so this uh, channel is uh, so relatively large. And uh, in this situation, I want to use a uh, so rotate micro -cacheter. In that situation, I change it to the uh, Colosseo XS. That is a uh, depend on the so figure of the channel or uh, so size of the channel. Thank you. So, so I have one question for uh, Dr. Kao or maybe Harding. You know, mm -hmm. recently we um, in Korea, the Turnpike microcatheter has been available, and actually um, the <laughs> Korean operators don't have much experience with that catheter, uh, but. Um, in my limited view, limited experience with the uh, uh, Turnpike LP, well, um, until now, I don't find much um, you know, uh, benefit over Corsair or the uh, uh, Caravan or, or all available uh, microcatheter that we have. So mm -hmm. could you advise uh, what kind of circumstance we can use Turnpike LP uh, in our um, you know, practice? Well. In my opinion, Turnpike LP is a pretty good microcatheter. Mm -hmm. uh, the difference of Turnpike LP to Corsair is that it's nose cone. I think the nose cone of Turnpike LP is longer mm -hmm. and the tapering is slender. I mean, mm -hmm. short, I mean, longer and also less uh, degree change of mm -hmm. that nose cone. So if the channel is very tortuous, especially when you have a Q band with the apex, in that situation, sometimes the Corsair nose cone cannot turn. Uh, in that situation, maybe Turnpike LP is good because the lo longer nose cone will negotiate the curve uh, better. So that is my comment. But we, we, uh, I think uh, Turnpike LP is also a pretty good one. Yeah. So long, longer nose cone means a uh, longer chip, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The tip nose chip cone is yes, yes, yes. I, I totally agree. So, Tampak LP sometimes overcome in uh, especially epicardial connection. Yes. So, just yes. right. Okay. Yes. Yes. No advantage in septal? <laughs> well, yes. If you have septal to septal connection. Mm -hmm. Oh, septal to septal. Septal to okay. septal. So, at the very <laughs> distal, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. usually yeah, yeah. there's a V shaped bend there. Yes. And, uh, and uh, sometimes you need a uh, Tampak LP to go through that uh, bend. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other comment? Dr. Uh, Muramatu? Yes, so the, the, uh, Dr. Kao, mm -hmm. I think uh, recently the epicardial channel is a more important issue because of the septal channel is uh, quite quite easier uh, compared <laughs> than before. So the how to, uh, but the uh, epicardial channel is uh, quite difficult to expect to succeed or fail before the procedure. Mm. What are your opinions on the, 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 the appropriate or well, uh, yeah, yeah. possible to cross the epicardial channel before the procedure? How do you think about it? Uh, I think, I think if, if you have a CTO and you do the calculation and the epicardial is the higher score channel, then you have to go for the epicardial but get yourself ready for these appropriate devices. Uh, SUO 03, Caravel, Corsair XS, Turnback LP. I mean, you have to have these, these devices, appropriate devices ready. And also you have to understand how to handle these devices. Like I mentioned earlier, when we negotiate the channels, uh, we should not rotate the wire too much. And also we should follow the microcatheter with the wire not to let the wire to go out too far, unless it's very you know, smooth. There's no resistance, of course, you can let the wire go. Otherwise, you should follow the microcatheter step by step, not to expose the wire too much. And also pay attention, like I said, to the uh, ECG change and also the cardiac cycle. Mm -hmm. I think- you, 
you show us the uh, the score score issue of the total steel or uh, yeah. basic size. Yeah. So which which is a which is a yeah. bit. Yeah, yeah in, in my system, I think tortuosity is more important. Mm -hmm. So for the straight vessel, you get two points. But for big one, you have only one point. That's according to our an, uh, analysis, statistical analysis. So for me, I think tortuosity is more important than size. Yep. So if you have a channel that is straight but smaller, the other one is tortuous but very big, I still go for the uh, straight one. Yep, yep. Yeah. That's true. Okay, okay, thank you everyone. Uh, it's time to move uh, second session. So we can't hear you, Dr. Matsuno. Uh, hi, everyone. And it's a great honor to be here and to make a presentation about uh, reverse cut problems and its solution. Uh, I have nothing to disclose. Needless to say, reverse card is now the most dominant wire crossing technique in the retrograde approach. And uh, in the, during the procedure, once collateral channels are successfully crossed by a wire and a microcatheter, subsequent procedure can be quite promising. However, uh, there are still small number of cases where the reverse cut uh, pro procedure fails or takes a long time. A recent report from Hong Kong colleague uh, from the APCDL club showed fifth reverse cut accounted for approximately 30% of failure mode in the retrograde approach. So there is a large need to make the reverse cut procedure quicker and more reliable and more efficient. This is a retrograde CTO algorithm of APCDL club and it recommends the majority of the CTO should be crossed with directed reverse cut. Directed reverse cut is a recently proposed one and is an effective and efficient technique, which is characterized by the use of a 2.0 or 2.5 small anti-grade balloon and intentional vessel tracking and penetration with a directable retrograde wire, such as Gaia or Gaia X series of wires, and recommended to be attempted first for CTOs with clear proximal cap and clear occlusion course and without heavy calcification and torturosity. This is the proximal LAD CTO case. And you can see the not so long CTO with a straight course. Of course, I started from anti-grade wiring with Gainex 2, but it deviated rightward in the craniocranial view. So at that time, I moved onto the retrograde approach. Septal channel uh, was successfully crossed with SO03 and a retrograde Corsair reached the distal true lumen. And this is the tip injection through retrograde Corsair. And before advancing retrograde wire, a anti-grade Corsair Pro was retracted and exchanged for the 2 balloon uh, within the CTO segment and inflated as a target. When the retrograde Gynex 1 was carefully advanced to direct the end tip of the anti-grade balloon, and after pushing the end tip of the balloon, uh, the anti-grade balloon was deflated. Then the retrograde guy next one uh, was smoothly uh, jumped into the balloon created space and the reverse cut was easily successful. But unfortunately, not all CTOs can be crossed with directed reverse cut. Directed reverse cut sometimes fails and uh, that, uh, for example, the long plus CDO, a CDO, long CDO with ambiguous course, tortuosity, and calcification is not indication for directed reverse cut from the beginning. beginning. In the long plus CDO, uh, APCTO club recommends a primary intentional retrograde knock wire. So in these cases, the conventional revived cuts should be performed. So in these situations, uh, the, there can be uh, difficulty to achieve reverse cut and anti-grade IVERS examination is quite a powerful tool. IVERS allows definition of the position of the anti-grade and retrograde wires in a vessel, determination of whether or not a connection has been made and precise sizing of the vessel and the balloon size uh, resulting in facilitating the reverse cut. Uh, this illustration shows the 
traditional uh, four patterns of anti-grade and retrograde wire positions seen on IBERS. And I'd like to talk about what to do uh, in each pad wire pattern. First, the uh, first one is that when the anti-grade and retrograde wires are in the intra-plug area, it is easy to make a connection after anti-grade balloon dil dilatation if needed, retrograde puncture of the intimal plaque with a penetrative wire such as uh, Gynex C or CP12 could be performed. Uh, this pattern is typical in, uh, in the directed reverse cut. What happens? What happens in the directed reverse cut? And the second pattern is the anti-grade wire and retrograde wires are in the subindival space. Uh, it is also uh, easy to make a connection in the same space after anti-grade balloon dilatation. But in this case, anti-grade wire is in a sub space, so too much sized uh, anti-grade balloon inflation can cause perf vessel perforation, so uh, too large balloon uh, usage should be avoided. And the third pattern is the anti-grade wire is in the intraplug. On the other hand, the retrograde wire is in a sub space. In this pattern, it is crucial to create a medial dissection uh, with a proper side balloon dilatation uh, to make a connection between anti-grade and retrograde wires. But uh, in the large vessel with positive remodeling, uh, it sometimes fails, and it may be possible to advance the anti-grade wire distally to enter the sub space or to perform the move the cap techniques, uh, such as the base or the scratch and go techniques. And the fourth final one pattern is the uh, anti-grade wire is in sub intimal and the retrograde wire is intra -plug. Uh This is the most difficult situation uh, because anti-grade balloon dilatation only enlarges the sub space with low probability of making a connection. So when the anti-grade balloon is deflated, the enlarged sub space immediately collapse or recoils and uh, uh, no longer makes a uh, connection. So there are some solutions for this situation. The one solution is to puncture big anti-grade balloon with retrograde high penetration force wire, for example, CP12. And the second one is uh, to advance retrograde wire proximally to change the positional relationship between the two wires. And final one is to perform traditional cut with a retrograde balloon entry. And uh, this illustration below shows the, uh, the, this uh, unfavorable pattern of the wires. Uh, at the distal part, I was showed uh, anti-grade wire is in the sub space and retrograde wire is in plug area. But uh, after retrograde wire was, is advanced more proximally, uh, the retrograde wire advances within the intraplug area and finally goes into the sub space. So at the mid portion, uh, you can see the uh, both anti-grade and retrograde wires are in the intraplug area. And the more proximal part, you can see anti-grade wire is intimo and retrograde wire is sub space. Anyway, uh, you can find more favorable points to perform reverse cut after advancing retrograde wire approximately. This is the mid rca CTO, super long CTO with vessel course ambiguity and classification. And the uh, first attempt was made in another uh, hospital. The operator was not, not, not me. And anyway, the operator at that time uh, bravely advanced anti-grade wire with uh, under contralateral injection at the wire uh, advanced into the strange position. And finally, uh, the procedure was unsuccessful with severe dissection or perforation. Um, uh, fortunately, the patient was safe and referred to our institute for the second attempt. This is the pre-interventional angio at the second attempt. And you can, uh, you can still see the uh, long, very long CTO. Anyway, septal channel uh, tracking was performed uh, with SO03. The primary retrograde approach was performed. This is tip injection through retrograde Corsair Pro, and you can see the contrast staining, but the diesel cap was very hard unexpectedly, and I couldn't penetrate with UV3. So I 
used, exchanged uh, UP3 for CP12 and performed distal cap penetration. And after that, CP12 was uh, exchanged back for UB3, and UB3 uh, was advanced uh, within a CTO segment to overcome the bending portion of the mid RCA. At that time, the anti grade preparation was performed uh, as a retrograde wire as a landmark, and uh, anti grade wire was advanced to make a guide wire overlap. But uh, particularly in the area of coda view, the anti-grade and retrograde wire were much apart from each other. And I was not certain uh, which wire was in the correct position. So I advanced an uh, anti-grade wire within the CTO segment, performed two of balloon dilatation, and advanced IVAS catheter within the CTO segment. Then IVAS revealed unexpectedly the anti-grade wire was in the sub space, uh, on the contrary, retrograde wire was intrapropic area. So this is the uh, unfavorable, most difficult situation, as I told you. In this case, I advanced retrograde UB3 more proximally and perform IVAS again. So here you can see the anti-grade wire, it was in the intra-plug area and retrograde wire uh, went into the sub space. The situation has changed. So, and now the, the, the vessel size here is very big at uh, over four millimeter. So I uh, first uh, performed anti-grade 3.5 millimeter balloon inflation at the overlap site and performed conventional reverse cut. Fortunately, the connection had been made and the retrograde C on black is, was successfully crossed into the proximal true lumen. And there is another difficult situation in reverse cut after the connection has been made. Uh, once a connection has been successfully created, the retrograde wire can be caught up in disease, dissection, recoil, or tortuosity in the vessel proximal to the connection point, especially uh, in the mid uh, RCA long CTO or especially in long CTO case. For example, this is the uh, proximal RCA, again, super long CTO from proximal to the distal bifurcation. And anyway, the primary to grade approach was attempted and septal channel was successfully crossed. And in this case, I performed retrograde knuckle wiring with Sion block like this and, uh, with the support of Corsia. And after that, the anti-grade wires advanced, also advanced within the CTO segment in a knuckle fashion and made an overlap. Then the anti-grade wire UB3 was further advanced uh, distally uh, with the retrograde wire as a landmark. And then seven French uh, guide extension catheter was advanced with coaxial anchor technique to the overlap site. And advanced uh, IVAS catheter within guide extension catheter. And uh, after checking uh, IVAS uh, that the red, both guide wires were in the same sub space, the guide extension catheter was advanced uh, further uh, to the connection point. Then the retrograde C on black was easily advanced into the anti-grade guide extension catheter and guide extension reverse cut was successful. This is the last slide. Uh, to make reverse cut procedure a more successful and efficient, a directed reverse cut should be attempted first for suitable CTO agents to maximize effectiveness and efficiency. And IVAS guidance is useful and powerful to facilitate reverse cut procedure in failed directed reverse cut case and conventional reverse cut cases. And finally, guide extension catheter is helpful when there is difficulty in retrograde wiring into the proximal true once after a connection has been created. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much for uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Masundo uh, showed us the, uh, uh, several cases. I'm sorry for my internet. So uh, let's save the time and follow the schedule. And uh, next speaker will be uh, Dr. Lo from the Sydney uh, Liverpool Hospital and give us another lecture and we'll discuss later. So thank you much for the invitation. And uh, my role is to talk about retrograde algorithm in terms of the retrograde knuckle wiring technique, when and how. Here's my disclosures. 
the ABC Theco algorithm uh, has, uh, was published in 2017, and of course it melded some hybrid techniques, particularly ADR and the integrated approach, and also melded the traditional Japanese techniques what we've seen with Ivers guided entry of the resolving the proximal cap, as well as uh, the use of cross-boss, at least uh, consideration of a cross-boss in instant CTO uh, occlusions. Interestingly, most importantly, the safety aspects of when to stop in terms of time in the procedure, contrast use, and X-ray radiation. But in the retrograde approach, particularly uh, uh, in terms of knuckle wire, there were specific recommendations using uh, knuckle wires for dissection reentry in terms of ambiguous course of a CTO, a long length lesion, more than 20 millimeters, uh, and I think there's a long plus version, tortuous CTO anatomy, heavy calcification, perhaps previous attempts. So. This is kind of the ABC of knuckle wire technique, and these things we've seen already in Dr. Mazzuno's talk. And uh, well, why knuckle wires? It's a sort of a hybrid approach that's been uh, particularly amalgamated. It's been popularized in the original algorithm in 2012. And that's because if uh, we're wiring anti-grade, we're wired to a, a retrograde injection of a angiographic target of the distal vessel beyond the CTO segment. In a retrograde technique, you're wiring to a proximal uh, uh, angiographic target and if it's very long, we don't really know exactly where it, that is because vessels may be very tortuous. Now, if you spend a lot of time doing this with escalating wire uh, penetration wires, it's very easy and can be very dangerous uh, to perforate the coronary vessel, either from a retrograde or an antigrade approach, but we're talking on the retrograde side. Now, uh, if you knuckle a wire with blunt force, uh, we can stretch, uh, use the stretchability of the adventitia and negotiate a tortuous course of a vessel more safely. Whereas a stiffer wire, they tend to be much more straighter, will go through a straight course. And even though you, we think we can manipulate them, we really can't wire tortuous vessels with a Conquest Pro 12 because it tends to go straight. And the wire perforation risk over a long course must be much higher. So really, why do we knock a wire? We've mentioned already, we negotiate around the calcification. We, uh, we negotiate tortuosity and, and, and anatomical ambiguity and also a long distance of a CTO segment, uh, largely very safely, because we tend to perforate a lot less. The main principle is that there's not rocket science, and hybrid operators will say that we, we don't know how to wire anything. Uh, we don't teach people to wire anything. We just basically teach people to push a wire with force. And so it's a force is, uh, of course, pressure equals force over per unit area. And of course, if you support it with a strong guiding catheter support and strong microcatheter, this is okay and it tends to blunt dissect and cause within the adventitia, whereas stiffer wires tend to perforate. Well, we've seen already in previous talks that once you've actually made uh, or passed the CTO segment, uh, we want to make a connection. And so we still need to do a re-entry technique, uh, usually reverse cart. The equipment we need is pretty simple. We need a good guiding catheter support and a good strong microcatheter. So Corsair is very popular. Uh, of course, other microcatheters are used. We've heard of turnpike LPs, uh, caravels, and occasionally there are other techniques you can use, including uh, anchor balloon techniques in a retrograde sense, which may increase your backup force. The wire has been pop popularized by the hybrid operators with Pilot 200, but we've seen C on Black used, and now there's a Gladius uh, wire, Gladius and Gladius Mongo. Now, we find that with practice, any wire can potentially be knuckled. It really is about the size of the knuckle. And previously, uh, 10 years ago, the hybrid operators are using the XT wire, which have been a little bit phased out. And so ideally, uh, with reasonable pushable force of the wire, and it can make a smaller knuckle, because all knuckles make a fairly large subintimal space. And in the ABCTO club algorithm, from the anti-grade uh, mode kind of view, a big intimal subintimal space makes it difficult to do parallel wiring, as much as it makes it difficult to do anti-grade dissection and re-entry. Now, the anti-grade proximal technique we can see that you can actually do what they call power knuckle. That's exactly what we think is that you need a lot of uh, support from the microcatheter even to be able to push the wire on occasion, particularly if you're going around a calcified proximal cap. Now, this is a little bit harder to introduce in the retrograde sense because we, it's hard to deliver a balloon next to your microcatheter and actually in, inflate it for an extra support uh, to push your wires. Let me show you just uh, quickly the principles of a long plus CTO a long lesion, more than 20 millimeters, tortuous, ambiguous, or calcified. And of course, if you're doing a lot of wiring, then uh, it, it, it's more likely you would fail. This is kind of what we look like. 
Now, the interesting thing is that, you know, the microcatheter retrograde is due to a distal cap. The procedural considerations are how hard do you try? So once your wire exits a microcatheter, do we do more wiring? How much longer do we do more wiring? Which wires are we using? So we can use an escalated wire principle and actually go from a UB3 wire to a CP12 wire. But really, when do we decide to knuckle? And you can see here, this is a long plus CTO. The probability of wiring success would be low. And once you wire, uh, knuckle a wire, you can see that it, it breaches the tortuosity in course. And actually, it makes a, a 90 degree turn here, which is perhaps not so predictable. And actually, after that, it makes another turn proximally. So this is kind of a much safer in a spent sense. The proximal integrated approach was also knuckle wire around the first bend. And then a reverse cut was done and I was examined and, and stented successfully. This is a case of a post-bypass surgical patient. And you can see that there's a long-ish with an island uh, in the middle of a, a two CTOs in a right coronary artery. Now, often, of course, the distal cap is at the bifurcation. And in this particular case, we needed to use a Conquest Pro wire, a Pro 12 wire to puncture the cap and then knuckle a, a Sion black wire. And then you can see that that negotiated almost all the CTO, shortened it. This is a little bit aged case. And so there was an extended reverse card with a balloon and a, a wire in the branch and a stent procedure. You can see a disruption here in the uh, crux where the Conquest Pro 12 wire was. This is also a longish right coronary CTO with a small island. And you can see that it previously attempted. So it's a JCTO forward long and some tortuosity and a little bit of calcium proximally. Once again, this, in this case, it was quite difficult to break the proximal cap and Carlino procedure was done and an integrate knuckle as well as a retrograde knuckle was performed and it's assisted by a guideline or a guide extension, uh, which had broken the proximal tortuosity as well as the um, uh, ability to do that uh, safely. The integrate balloon is removed here into the guide extension and wire easily crossed. And after some coronary stenting, uh, a very acceptable result, an IVUS was performed. You can see a pocket the subintimal that uh, hopefully should heal at the, around the distal right coronary artery. In this case, this is a post bypass surgical case. In fact, almost 10 PCIs were done over a three year period with lots of drug eluting balloons, as well as a repeated stenting of a vein graft to the right coronary artery in a 78 year old man. And he, and he had repeated presentations. So there's already some risk stenosis. This is only a few weeks after the last procedure. And you can see a knuckle wire is formed now uh, uh, with the Corsair catheter uh, using, I think, a Sion black wire. It also negotiated this uh, tortuosity. In this particular case, uh, there's still an ambiguous cap proximally and a reverse cart conventionally was done, assisted by guide extension and uh, notably uh, not too hard thereafter because the vessel size was very good. Uh, I was checked and it was mostly some intimal actually and uh, excellent result. You can see a backflow of the vein graft, which is still patent at the present time. So actually, well, how good is it when you uh, stent uh, long segments of subintimal stenting? Uh, there's not a lot of evidence, but uh, Dr. Walsh and the uh, uh, hybrid group had pre presented a consistent CTO study, and they were quite successful in 210 out of 231 patients, 91% success rate. This JCTO score 2.4, plus or minus 1.3, with lesion length more than 29 millimeters. At one year, the target vessel failure rate including cardiac death, and I think there was uh, no cardiac death in the 210 patients. Myocardial infarction and ischemia-driven TLR was only 5.7%. Overall MACE was 10% uh, at one year and 17% at two years. And it, it was uh, the OCT healing study part of this showed no major difference between um, interval strategies and sub-interval stenting. And they were quite uh, happy with the results. And so in intermediate outcomes were very acceptable despite relatively long dissection re-entry strategies and stenting. So in conclusion, I think the knuckle wire technique is useful adjunct and we've seen in difficult retrograde CDO PCI. It is a relatively safe uh, procedure and it is sufficient negotiation of ambiguous vessel course, a long CTO lesion and avoids hopefully possibly around calcification although calcification remains difficult and see who operators should be familiar and comfortable with this technique as it'll be useful in some of the procedures, but perhaps not all of them. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for uh, Professor Lowe's lecture. And uh, we're quite behind the schedule. And uh, uh, please, the uh, next speaker will be Scott Harding from the Wellington Hospital, New, England, New Zealand. <laughs>
Thank you very much. It's uh, great to be part of this APCTO session in uh, TCT AP. Um, unfortunately, virtual version, but hopefully next year, we never know. Um, so I'm going to talk about wire externalization hurdles and solutions. Um, so these are my disclosures. So we've already heard about uh, a lot about rich grade approach to CTO, uh, which obviously is one of the essential approaches that we use. And there's a uh, well-known standard way of doing this, which has already gone through. So I'm not going to um, use time up doing that. But essentially, externalization of the wire is, is, is part of the standard process. And that allows us to convert the uh, rich grade process into an anti-grade process. And uh, most of the time, this goes pretty smoothly, but um, there are situations, um, some of which we've already seen, where this can be problematic. So the standard uh, wire externalization uh, occurs uh, after we've uh, done uh, uh, either a reverse cart or direct uh, 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 retrograde wire crossing, which allows us to advance the retrograde microcatheter past the CTO and at that point, we want to wire into the anti-grade wire and into the anti-grade guide. And usually we swap out the stiff uh, penetrate wire for a more soft wire. So here's a cell on black so that we don't damage the proximal vessel. Uh, so we successfully wire into the uh, anti-grade wire guide. And then we balloon trap in the anti-grade guide, which then allows us to pull our rich grade microcatheter into the anti grade guide, and at that point we can deflate, remove the anti grade wire, and advance uh, externalization wire uh, such as the RG3 or R350. And then the case can be turned into an anti grade case, and this is the final result in this one after all the rich grade um, kit has been removed. So occasionally we do find difficulties, and uh, as I said, we've already seen some cases where this has occurred, and that's because we can have uh, difficulty advancing the retrograde wire from the proximal vessel into the anti-grade wire, and that may be because of angulation or uh, disease in the proximal, C proximal to the CTO segment. Uh, we may have uh, problems with the retrograde microcatheter being too short and unable to reach the anti-grade guide. Uh, we may uh, be unable to advance the retrograde microcatheter catheter due to disease, or we may be having problems with ischemia in the donor vessel, which would make it uh, better to try and convert the uh, case to integrate as soon as possible. So what are the potential solutions? Well, we can change the guide catheter and uh, select sometimes to improve the angle, uh, particularly in the right if we change to JL4, sometimes that's better than AL1. Uh, we can use a guide extension catheter and, and frequently in a reverse cart now, uh, we use uh, guide extension catheters. We've heard about stent reverse cart. This should be a last resort and it's very rarely used nowadays. Snaring, again, in my view, should only very rarely be used and uh, most commonly in uh, sort of osteo uh, right coronary lesions. Um, and, of course, there's the rendezvous or uh, tip-in technique, which we'll discuss. So everyone's uh, very familiar with guide extension catheters, and these have been a, a, a great uh, uh, help in uh, reverse CART, and they certainly allow us to overcome proximal tortuosity, um, allow us to overcome proximal disease, and um, to change the position. If you watch carefully here, we couldn't make the reverse CART further down just by um, dynamically changing the position of the uh, Guideline, it made it very easy to wire, uh, wire into the uh, integrated light guide. So these are pretty standard now, uh, part of reverse car. What about snares? Uh, as I said, you know, and you heard from Eugene that snaring really uh, should be a, a way down the list of solutions um, because of the problems that can be associated with it. Generally, when we're snaring the uh, water, we uh, favor large three loop snares. And uh, we don't need the snare sheath because um, we use the integrated um, guide catheter instead. And what we heard is it's um, safe to snare on the uh, uh, wire used for externalization, such as RG3 on the soft portion of the wire, because uh, ideally once we um, snare the wire, we want to externalize it. But of course, it's not always easy to get a uh, RG3 into the integrated guide. Um, 
if we can't advance the retrograde microcatheter. And so sometimes it may be necessary to um, uh, snare a short wire. Uh, but the danger in this, as you've heard, is that if we snare the short wire, uh, particularly on the, um, on the stiff bit, we can kink it and then uh, we may not be able to release that short wire or we may not be able to uh, uh, get it back into uh, the, the retrograde um, system. So it, it can be a very dangerous situation and should be avoided. So it tends to use the end snare. If we're going to snare in the water and uh, occasionally um, we can use gooseneck snares for snaring in the coronaries. Um, so as I say, the most common uh, case for snaring the aorta is an aorta osteal uh, lesion. Um, so this is uh, an instant restenosis, uh, CTO, uh, of the right coronary, and you can see that the right coronary artery guide is not engaged at the moment, so there's rich grade crossing out into the aorta and attempts made to um, engage the antegrade guide and it's unsuccessful, and then snaring is performed uh, with an end snare um, and can see it's gone through one of the loops and then pulled back on the soft portion into the guide and catheter. And also snare in the coronary, so the snaring in the left main with a gooseneck snare. Again, I very rarely do this. Again, it's important to do it on the soft um, portion of the uh, guide wire. And uh, you can see it being retrieved back into the uh, anti-grade guide. The rendezvous, uh, rendezvous technique or tipping technique, as the Americans would call it, can be very useful. Um, can be used to help facilitate guide wire externalization, but also convert um, to an anti-grade uh, approach without externalization. It's particularly useful when the uh, microcath is too short to reach anti-grade guide. That's much less of a problem now that we have guide extension catheters. Uh, when disease prevents passage of the retrograde microcatheter into the anti-grade guide, or you want to convert um, to an anti-grade case without externalization, which is the most common reason that it's used. So essentially, uh, we need to, uh, uh, the rendezvous is most commonly um, performed in the guide catheter. It can be performed in the coronary where it's more difficult. Um, and we want to align the uh, anti-grade and retrograde microcatheters. And then we can either uh, insert the anti-grade guide wire into the retrograde microcatheter, or alternatively, the retrograde guide wire into the anti-grade microcatheter. So uh, this is a, a sort of schematic uh, diagram to go through the rich grade rendezvous. So uh, we have the rich grade uh, catheters still in the, in the coronary artery. We can advance the wire into the anti-grade guide. And then uh, by usually uh, in the curved por uh, portion of the guide, utilizing the, wide bi uh, the wire bias, we can get into the anti-grade microcatheter. We can then uh, pull back the retrograde microcatheter and advance the anti-grade uh, microcatheter over the retrograde wire through the CTO. Um, often we need some support for this. Uh, and then once we've done that, we can remove the retrograde wire and then advance an anti-grade wire. Um, and then uh, that allows us essentially to have an anti-grade system. So I'll show you a case um, just demonstrating this. So this is um, a, a case where we've uh, crossed rich grade. Um, you can see here, we're trying to wire uh, into the anti-grade uh, microcatheter and we successfully do. As I said, usually we can perform this on, on, the, on the bend is the best place to try and uh, do this. And then once we've um, uh, managed to do this, we want to advance the uh, anti-grade microcatheter. And you can see we've advanced anti-grade microcatheter. And uh, you can see that we've got an anchor balloon to help us um, advance the anti-grade microcatheter through the uh, CTO segment. Of course, we've retracted the um, retrograde microcatheter. And essentially, we just chase the retrograde microcatheter down. And then once we've done that, we can remove the retrograde wire and just advance our anti-grade wire through the anti-grade microcatheter. And essentially, then we have an anti-grade uh, system which we can work over. Um, as I mentioned, we can do it the other way around. So this is an anti-grade wire uh, wiring into a retrograde microcatheter. And the purpose of this is really just to avoid wire externalization. 
Um, and uh, and this is uh, particularly useful where there's problems with ischemia um, um, because of the collaterals or if um, we've uh, gone through a septal where the collateral joins very close to the CTO, um, the distal CTO cap. So in summary, um, in some cases, wire externalization can be challenging and it's important to know what equipments and techniques can be used to overcome these problems. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, uh, studying for your wonderful lecture. Uh, Sensei, and can we, we still have five minutes? <clears throat> okay, so we have a few minutes for discussion. So any comments, question from panelists? Maybe I can ask uh, uh, Sydney. Uh, Sydney, you mentioned a few uh, commonly used guide wire for the uh, knuckle wiring technique. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, of these, which one produced the smallest uh, naka that you were? I think, I think I've been using a lot more of the uh, Gladius Mongo. I think it's a very good wire for this, and uh, <laughs> the, I think that uh, that that's actually uh, quite a good um, good size. Uh, it's a small knuckle for that, and uh, it's quite, quite favourable. So it's made to be a knuckle wire. So I think that it's true to name. Uh, if you don't have that on the shelf, then part 200 is very acceptable. The Gladius makes a slightly bigger, the, the original Gladius makes a bigger loop. Mm. Thank you. Donnie? Yes. I, 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 can, uh, I will ask you, and uh, uh, how do you think about your long-term outcome? So if you yeah. need a long, long way, Nakuwaya, make sure the uh, long standing, the sub mm. standing. Mm. So yeah, I think the, how, how long did you... Allow to 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 the knock wire means a long standing, long sub intimate standing. Yeah, I think that some of the cases you've seen uh, are extremely long. So I think that they were uh, uh, particularly useful in getting the case done uh, in difficult situation. I think I agree with you. We don't have long term data. I've only just shown the consistent CTO data, which only published in year 2000. And so they've had up to two years follow up. Overall, the intermediate outcomes are not unreasonable, uh, but I think that, it, as I say, the longer the length of subintimal stenting, maybe the results may not be resilient long term, but I don't think we know exactly. So I think that probably it means that we need to watch these people for a lot longer and they'll be more careful with follow up with the patients because the outcomes may be more visible. The original STAR paper was very, very poor uh, kind of results. This is slightly better. But and they did OCT, so it was encouraging to know recover. Uh, the healing was quite good at uh, one year, but we, I think the long term results remains to be seen. Well, may I may I add mm. uh, to this uh, point? I think uh, to discuss about the length of the subintimal space is actually a myth, and mm. that is the myth with the consistent CTO study. I think if the subintimal space the length of the subintimal space is limited within the proximal and distal cap. I mean, within the CTO body, I think it, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But we shouldn't have any subintimal space beyond the distal cap. And that's yes. why we think that the retrograde knuckling is better than anti knuckling and yes. should be better than ADR because you will extend your subintimal space beyond the distal cap and jeopardizing the distal branches and influencing the distal runoff and outflow. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the question. So I yes. think discussing the length of the subintimal is probably a wrong question. We should be asking, are we actually beyond, standing beyond the uh, distal cap? Yeah, yeah. I, I think in a, in a proportion, and I think the number is a little bit nebulous, in a proportion of cases when you knuckle, you are actually somewhat intimal on IVUS. And I think it's un, a little bit unknown uh, I think there's more so in larger vessels that they do in the in the registries. So I think in some situations they're almost always subintimal, or uh, and then in the other situations maybe they're more intimal than subintimal, and hence the results are, are very difficult to know depending on what kind of patients you're doing. Okay, uh, I think uh, usually knuckle wire technique is available for long RCA CTO region, and uh, operators should uh, pay attention to keep patency of. PL branch and uh, PD branch both. That is a very important point. So uh, subintimal space length is uh, another so, uh, important problem. I agree to you, so, mm. say. Agree, agree. Yeah. 
Any other comment, question, Dr. E? Still, I think that um, uh, retro, uh, despite the good concept of the retrograde knuckling, still the, this uh, technique is underused in Asia Pacific, especially in Korea and Japan. So um, I just want to ask um, um, the panelists from the Japan, is there any reason that we, we are not using this um, retrograde knuckling um, that frequently, or is this only my thoughts? Is it really underused, or are we really using this technique effectively in our practice? Any comment for this? Because, you know, in Korea, uh, we rarely see uh, operators doing retrograde knuckling um, mm. in every live cases and every um, operators. So I'm really curious if this technique is really uh, frequently or effectively used in uh, our practice. <laughs> I, I, th I think probably it's partly due to the teaching and the style because they came from the hybrid operators and they said, once again, they don't teach people how to wire anything. It's always front knuckle and back knuckle, integrate and retrograde knuckle and connect. And so they say stay in the tissue and it's safe and fast. Whereas I think that we will try to do some wiring, uh, maybe a little bit longer, uh, even retrograde sense. And sometimes that shortens the CTO segment because we don't do uh, personally in Australia we don't do much multi uh, slice CT but we do a little bit of wiring and so sometimes the CTOs you're much closer to connecting and if that's the case uh, and you can lose tissue track on either front I think that we, we spend more time you minimize the need for that so probably the need is less yeah. I mean I, I would agree with Paul I, I, I think the key here is that you want to keep the mapping within the CTO segment but it's more than that is, you know, when people get carried away and, you know, and there's knuckle with very large subintimal spaces, very easy to get a hematoma that then sort of, you know, progresses either antigrade or retrograde. Uh, and so, you know, personally, I, I, I think, you know, wiring is good. There's situations where we should use uh, a knuckle and that's when there's ambiguity you know, tortuosity, calcifin, where we, we're basically either going to use a knuckle or very stiff wires, and we know it's dangerous to use stiff wires and those things. But I still believe that, you know, we should be trying to minimise the knuckle segment, and we certainly should be trying to keep that within the CTO. Even in the right coronary, you know, losing RV marginal branches of a substantial size is not a good thing. Yeah. In general, in Japan, uh, knuckle wiring is not so popular. <laughs> So, very, very limited use for a very special case. I, I think the mentality is that we should try our best to stay within plaque and we mm -hmm. should limit any subintimal space within proximal and distal cap. I think that's the mentality. So, mm -hmm. uh, for Dr. Lee, I think knuckling is suitable for certain lesion, but not all. So like uh, our, uh, our emphasis is that it, sh it should be a long plus. It should be long, ambiguous, tortuous, or calcified. But uh, I mean, not all the long lesions are like that. So, so like I said, we should try to be stay, staying within the plaque between the uh, proximal and distal cap. So use, use the knuckle in a limited fashion, but when you need to use it, it's safer than wiring. I think that's the that's the thought or concept. Okay. Any other comment? Maybe it's time to close the session. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So thank you, every lecturer you. and uh, every panelist, uh, to make this session successfully end. So we will close this session and bye bye. 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 Bye bye.